So, without further ado, I would like to um, invite the first lot of speakers. So, this is a, a pre record, the first one. But I'd like Peter Thurn to um, come up, please. So, Peter's going to um, introduce um, John O'Sullivan from uh, Ireland. Um, but first of all, just to introduce Peter. So, Peter's been in the herd improvement game for um, a little over 30 years. Is that true, Peter? 30 years? Um, this is where you say, no, it hasn't been that long. Unfortunately. <laughs> um, so uh, at that stage, um, or during that time, he's run uh, some of the largest breeding programs in, um, in Australia, in AI. Um, his role has expanded to manage semen production, animal health and quarantine, bull management and fodder production, just for, just for giggles. Um, he was around at the beginning of the genomics era, and he's watched the technology expand, as we just spoke about before. Peter joined Datagene in 2021, and your role is Stakeholder Relationship Specialist. Got that right. Um, and uh, in that role, he's got a, a wide playing field and includes working with industry to develop and deliver uh, Datagene's uh, products and services. Peter, are you going to introduce John, or would you like me to? Yeah. Okay. So um, Peter's going to be introducing and interacting with John, who um, is coming down uh, to us from Ireland. So John's a third generation farmer from County Cork in Ireland, um, and his family have an operation called Liz Duff Holsteins. So it's a 500 cow herd, it's near Cork City. Um, John was a long serving board member of the milk processor Dairy Gold. Uh, you would have seen sometimes their butter, potentially in the supermarkets. He's also been heavily involved in the Irish Cattle Breeders Federation, ICBF, as well as the Irish Holstein Friesian Association, um, serving as a chairman uh, of, um, of both of those. So he's a passionate supporter of Irish breeding, um, and their EBI, and uses a wide range of tools to ensure that the EBI of his herd is moving in the right direction. I suspect he's had a pint of Guinness with Mike McGann, who some of you might know, but um, I'll leave that to him to tell. Peter, over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks, John, and good morning, everybody. I'm going to be really brief because you'll pick up most of what you need to out of the, out of the presentation, but... A couple of little takeaways for me were, I just love in, in this interview with John, the way he describes how his business has evolved and how he's utilised technologies in that evolution of his business over, over probably 30 odd years. And it's, the other thing that I picked up is how a hardcore breeder can actually adopt these technologies and still be true to what he wants to achieve as a breeder but actually use them to get to where his goals are a whole lot quicker. So hopefully you'll pick up some of those same themes out of this, out of this chat with John that, uh, that I did. So I'll hand it over to the, to the IT guys. Well, good morning, everybody, and, um, and welcome to uh, what should be a really fun interview with John O'Sullivan of Liz Duff Holsteins in County Cork Island. John's a long-serving, or former long-serving board member of ICBF and the Irish Holstein Friesian Association and, and also of Dairy Gold. And he was chair of both the, the Irish Friesian, Holstein Friesian Association and, and the ICBF for quite, a, quite an extensive period. So welcome, John. It's a pleasure to have you on board. Thank you, Peter. So just to kick off, John, can you give us a little bit of an idea about whereabouts in Ireland you're, you, you are? Of course, County Cork is a big county in Ireland. Um, but also a little bit about your farm and its structure, your cow numbers, the family involvement, style of farming, those sort of things. Okay, please, I'll do my best. Um, right, the farm is located uh, about five miles north of Cork City. Uh, those of us who live in Cork regard it as the real capital of Ireland. Um, so you can see on the screen there where the little red dot is, that is the location of the farm there. Uh, I suppose we're in the heart of uh, serious farming country, in particular dairy farming. Uh, if you can see the uh, picture of the cows coming in for evening milking there on the farm roadway, and you can see in the background a big plain of ground, that's our next door neighbour. Uh, there's a valley in between, 
uh, and he milks about uh, 180 cows over there and has actually just installed uh, a pair of robots to go milking them. But anyway, um, the farm here, uh, I'll just give a small little bit of history to the whole thing, first of all. The whole thing started with my grandfather, actually, uh, who immigrated to America as a young man at, in or around the, the turn of the 1900s. And he finished up working in the copper mines in Montana. Uh, made some dollars there and came back and bought the farm adjacent to this one. Uh, he had uh, two sons and a daughter. And in 1943, this farm here that uh, I'm living on now uh, came up for sale. And uh, the family bought this farm then. And my father moved here in uh, the 1950s with eight short horn cows. And that was the start of dairy farming here. Uh, 1996, my uncle, who was on the original farm and had no family, uh, asked me would I buy the farm off of him, and uh, we did that. So that gave us a base here then uh, of uh, 170 acres, and uh, along with uh, renting some ground and having bought some other ground in the meantime, we we are now farming uh, something just over 700 acres in total. We're making uh, 500 horse infrasions and rearing uh, all the female calves uh, from them. Um, the farmers, if you look at the picture of the four gentlemen who are fine, four fine looking gentlemen actually, who are standing up against the uh, corrugated iron background. On the left is David McGrath, our farm manager. He's working here with us with uh, 30 years. Next to him is uh, my son, Victor. Next to him is another son, John Jr. And then there is myself. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and Teresa, my good wife, of course, <coughs> she helps out here if we want something collected, if we want something delivered. Uh, she's the person who does all those kind of things. And of course, she keeps us all well fed. We do have three other sons. And in case that they ever get a chance to see this, if I don't mention them, I'll never hear the end of it. We have Donald, uh, our third son. He's a uh, uh, veterinary surgeon. Um, our fourth son is Robert, and uh, he's a microbiologist. He works with Eli Lilly near Kinsale. And our youngest son, Colm, uh, he is a doctor. So that's our story, really. Yeah. Very good. So tell us a little bit about the history of your herd and how it's evolved over, over time. Well, as I said, <clears throat> My, my, my father started here with eight short horn cows uh, back in the 50s and he decided at that stage that if he was going to milk cows, uh, he might as well be milking a good one as any other sort of one. And I suppose that kind of policy uh, has certainly prevailed all the way through to the present day. And at the time, uh, the cows in Ireland were short horn cows and when there was an odd farm turning up with one or two of these black and white cows that were called Frisians. And uh, there was a lot of talk about these, that these were the best animals for milk production, that they're the most efficient, they produce the most milk. And uh, he went to a couple of auctions and he bought uh, one or two uh, pedigree uh, British Frisians. And that was the start of the herd here. So I suppose the herd grew from there, he registered the calves and uh, I came along and even as a young fella, I had an interest in this and I started keeping the records for them and um, I suppose like I had this lifelong interest in the whole thing, the, the numbers grew, um, we, the early emphasis of course when we didn't have things like um, ICBF and we didn't have a database and we didn't have ways of measuring performance and that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the early emphasis was on having this fine looking cow uh, and, uh, you know, we were, we were following that line and uh, we did breed some fine looking cows. Uh, we used to take cows to shows and did quite well with them. But then, um, you know, with the advent of ICBF, uh, a lot of the milk recording data was being analysed and uh, 
a lot of a lot of interesting information coming through. I, I would have to say that even though the farm here has a long history in breeding pedigree horse and freesians, the farm would also have a long interest in good commercial farming. Uh, my father saw no reason why so we couldn't do both, and I would agree with that. You know, uh, I think too many people are trying to breed this uh, this show cow. They have a whole lot of uh, highly classified cows, and maybe are forgetting that the actual reason that they are in milk production, which primarily has to be about making money from the business. So anyway, uh, the database came along and we discovered that uh, with the advent of the economic breeding index, which is about um, determining the most profitable cow, not maybe necessarily the cow that gives the most kilos of um, uh, milk or kilos of milk solids, but it's about the most profitable cow um, for Ireland. And we discovered when that came out in the early 2000s, that whilst we had quite a high production uh, herd, we had uh, quite a highly classified herd, but we were in the bottom 10% nationally in um, EBI rankings. And, you know, it became quite clear to us that uh, EBI was being taken up by uh, milk producers out there. And that, you know, if you were going to be in the races in this business, that you had to um, put some emphasis on this. At the time, we found it quite difficult to find the kind of bulls that we needed to, to get to keep the type of cow that we had, but to improve the uh, index as well. But that has improved over time. And uh, now it's there are quite a number of bulls available that um, fill the, the, the requirements that we have uh, to use. So does that help, Peter? It does. And you're even breeding now. You've got to the point now, John, where your herds at a, at a EBI level where you're actually starting to breed some bulls that are ending up at the top end of the EBI list, like, like the guy on the screen at the moment. Uh, yes, um, <clears throat> I suppose uh, we have moved a long ways. Uh, we've moved from the bottom ten percent. We're now in the top. Uh, we're into the top twenty-five percent now, and certainly the ambition is uh, in five years' time to be in the top ten percent uh, nationally. And you know, you're going to ask me how are we doing that? So we are using um, high-index bulls or also quite decent confirmation bulls. And I suppose the biggest thing that has happened, there's no doubt about this, is the advent of genomic testing. And with the last five or six years, <clears throat> we are genomically testing every heifer calf that arrives on the, on the farm. And that has been a big driver. Um, I suppose I'd add to that the fact that, you know, we have always used the latest technology as it comes along. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, we, we've been using AI here with over 40 years, even with a big number of cows, there are no stock bulls used here. Um, we are using, uh, some people would describe maybe a ridiculous amount of uh, sex semen. Um, all our young stock one calf to sex semen and most of the cows. In fact, in advance of this uh, this morning, I was looking at um, our figures last night and from a herd of 500 cows, we will produce about 400 heifer calves uh, in the 12 months from uh, 1st of April last year to the 1st of April this year. Uh, so we've been using, we have used embryo transfer extensively in the past, haven't used it with, uh, there was a big gap then where we didn't use it at all. We put the money that we might have put into embryo transfer into the sex semen. But now we're bringing embryo transfer back into the scene again. And with a combination of uh, sex semen, embryo transfer and genotyping, I, there's a massive array of quite powerful tools now to uh, get to where you want to go to very rapidly. So you mentioned when we spoke earlier about your 
your young heifers and describe how you're how you're using the genomic information in in making decisions around what to do with your young heifers from a breeding perspective, especially the use of ET. Yeah, well, I suppose <clears throat> I go back again to the, what the ambition is, and the ambition is to be in the top 10% of herds nationally uh, in five years' time. But it's not to be there. It, 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 it figures in themselves alone are not the ultimate goal. The goal is to have those kind of figures, but to have the kind of cows that are photographed here in front of you now as well. Um, that cow and the, the right-hand photograph there is from our Mary family here. She's sired by a German bull called Gorini. He was a gold win out of an old man. That bull bred extremely well for us. That cow was classified excellent in 92. And the um, cow on the bottom left here is, um, she's from the uh, Impala family. Some of your uh, listeners may be familiar with Elkindale, uh, Cletus Impala, uh, a cow that uh, did very well in Canada, bred two sons, Silky Custo and Silky Gibson. Uh, this is from that family. Uh, and that cow was classified exit in 91. So they're the kind of cows, the type of cow that we want, but we want them with the uh, high index. So our calves are born uh, and... Uh, at about between two and three weeks of age, the calves get dehorned. And as we're dehorning them, we take a hair sample, put it into the uh, little kit for the genotyping, and it gets posted away. So we have the results back from uh, that test in about three weeks. And uh, we ultimately, we want to keep the top indexed females. Now, obviously, if it's a top index female and it's from a cow that's classified XL91 or XL92, like that's the jackpot altogether, you know. But um, to stay in the herd, the animal will have to have uh, a high index value. Uh, so we have a lot of surplus females in, but we have found even in the space of three or four years that uh, the vast majority of our heifers are coming through with. Uh, quite decent and respectable um, EBI values. And uh, we have we have two sales actually every year uh, in October. We sell about 120 uh, heifers, 35 or 40 of which will be just after calving. And about 80 or 85 that will be calving the following January and February. The calf ones will all be in calf to sex semen. The ones that are after calving will have heifer calves sold from them on the same day as well. And that would be that's a quite lucrative business for us. Um, that is there are two forecasts now from the October sale of this year. Uh, that animal on the left hand side, uh, she sold for 2,800 guineas uh, on the day. Uh, the top price was uh, 3,050. And the top price for a calf was 1100 on the day. And uh, last June, uh, because we had so many of these heifer calves, uh, we had, uh, sorry, I'll just go back a second. We have that sale at uh, our local marketplace. So we take the 150 animals in total down there, and that sale is conducted there. And we had a sale of young stock then on the farm last June. These would be, there was about 30 animals that had been born in the previous autumn and uh, 30 or 35 that had been born in the spring. And they sold for an average of 1,250 uh, guineas on the day. So uh, I suppose because we're selling so many of these animals, uh, and we know that other people will have animals to sell too. And we're striving to stay out there in front, it's like whether you're selling motor cars or whether you're selling tractors or whatever you're selling, you know, you are in competition with other people. That's the reality of the situation. And you must try to present what you are selling to the best advantage. And, um, you know, we use every tool that is there uh, to, uh, to try to present what we have to the best advantage. So as the sales have developed, John, if it's not a rude question, what, what sort of proportion of your income is now coming from, from livestock sales? 
in 2021, that's last year, that it would have been uh, very close to 30%. Um, would have been a bit higher maybe the previous year, but uh, higher meat prices are starting to affect that in that you know the, the, the turnover from milk sales is very substantial now. Our base milk price here at the moment is uh, 40 cent a litre at 3.6 and 3.3 protein. And bear in mind, the milk that we sold for the year would have averaged 4.1 fat and 3.55 protein. So, you know, that's a, that'll be a big add-on to the base price as well. And uh, I know the board of our co-op, Dairy Gold, will be meeting today and they'll be fixing the price. And I anticipate another price rise on top of that again. So um, even selling the animals at good figures, um, it was 30% last year. Might fall a bit shy of it perhaps this year. I hope it won't. You know, I hope that we can keep selling away as we are. But uh, it'll be in at about 30% anyway, but it's a substantial addition to what I call the base revenue, which is the money that comes from the milk. And it's quite a complementary enterprise uh, when it's a, it's an offspring from the main enterprise. So when you've got your genomic results on your on your heifers and they're they're now at mating age, you how do you do you make some decisions around those heifers? Obviously, some of them will go into the sale. What do you do with the really good ones? And and do you use the genomic information to to help guide you when you're working out? How to how to breed those heifers? Um, ab absolutely, absolutely. Um, the first point I'd make is there is no point in genotyping your heifer calves if we're not going to make use of the information. And there's a number of ways to make use of it. For example, uh, and, and I'll come back to the heifers in a second, but I don't want to forget this point. There's a bull in the US at the moment, a bull called a renegade that I would love to be using widespread. However, uh, he's not rated very highly on fertility here in Ireland. His fertility figure is quite modest here. And there's a reluctance on our part to commit to him as much as we would like to on account of that. So where now, this is a bullet you'd like to use, but he has a weakness. Um, so what do you do? And we have used, we have used them on animals that have come out with very high fertility figures. And in fact, we have a heifer here uh, from the same family as that bull uh, that's in the Iowa that you showed there a while ago. Uh, she's the Kojan Twist Cow. She's uh, excellent, 91. Uh, and she was putting, she was, she was actually flushed to Renegade. We finished up with three heifer calves from her. And one of them, is actually one of the top five heifer calves that we had born last autumn. Now, we probably, without, without the knowledge uh, that the genotyping gives us uh, from both the sire side and the dam side, it would be very hard to make that kind of a constructive mating. So it gives us the confidence to do things like that, to use bulls that have a weakness, but have have strength in every other area to match them correctly to um, the animal that will give you the chance of getting the right sort of a calf uh, from them. Um, how did I get to there, Peter? Uh, we were talking about your better heifers as well. Oh, sorry. Yes, that's right. Yes, I beg your pardon. Yeah. So <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that uh, we had used AI extensively in the past. Um, we did because we had got a few embryos from the US. Uh, yeah, I go back a little bit again. Uh, I, I did explain that the herd started here with pedigree British Frisians. But in the late, I suppose mid to late 80s, the US and Canadian Holstein started to make an appearance uh, from in, in the form of um, the availability of AI. And the opportunity arose to acquire some embryos from the US. And uh, we bought some embryos from a cow called Pencol, Chairman Leslie, that has done, that has bred extremely well for us. We bought a really good heifer from um, Germany, 
the really good cow came from France. And, you know, with one or two other um, Holstein editions, we wanted to multiply these quickly. And so we used uh, ET extensively for a few years, and that got us into big numbers of these families. So subsequent to that, with the advent of the sex semen, we cut back on the uh, ET work, and we put the resources that we were putting into that into buying sex semen. Uh, but now we've realized that, you know, we have quite a few high-index calves coming through, and... Uh, um, genomic testing and I already explained to you what the ambition is for the next uh, five years and what we've started doing is we are now taking our top heifers that is the heifers with the, the a combination of top index and really strong cow families and we're flushing those uh, to produce what we call the, the, the super drivers uh, for the herd in the future. And we are producing now about uh, 20 of these calves uh, every year. And again, we'll flush a couple of these, uh, a couple of the best of those again. And that's where uh, we will have a stream of what we hope will be very high index, strong cow family, uh, heifers coming into the herd annually and it also gives us an opportunity you know in these sales that we have to put in an animal that if it was a unique calf from uh, any one of those cows we couldn't afford to sell it we'd have to keep it so you know like that cow there that leslie 153 she had um three heifer calves by sandy valley batman in the spring of 2021 and we decided when we were having the calf sale in June that we'd put in one of them into the sale. So there was three, three of them there. There was much between them and index figures. Uh, the highest DBI one was 290-something. The lowest was 275. We put in the one with the 275 into the sale, and she sold to the very north of the country for 3,900 guineas at uh, three months of age. And we still have two left in the herd, and you know we'll be using those now to uh, develop on again. Beautiful. So, tell us a little bit about the process of of genomic testing and and your sample collection, and how you go about that. Because you you mentioned that it that it happens at a very young age in your herd. Yes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, right. For example. Last night, uh, we, we when the calves are born here and born on every farm in Ireland, they have to be registered with the Department of Agriculture's uh, database. Tag on the year, you can see the, the calves tag there. And uh, uh, because you know we have enough sort of coast calving at the moment, now this is the spring calving season here in Ireland, we're having uh, anything from eight to 12 calves born here every day. And I just sit down here at the computer every night and the calves that are registered, I register them on the um, Department of Agriculture's database. So uh, the I was here last night and the calves I registered last night are on the Department's database this morning. And by tomorrow morning, they would have transferred from there to the cattle breeding database that ICBF maintains. So all that happens seamlessly. So when I had those calves registered last night, I just clicked into the ICBF database and uh, I, clicked, I clicked onto the genotyping service and uh, there is a facility on that uh, that you, you, know, you can order a batch of uh, genotypes. And there is one particular column which says uh, all calves available, all female calves available from genotyping born in 2022. So I've already booked uh, 85 of those. And so I went on to it again last night and I booked another 35. In other words, all calves born since that 85 up to uh, about two days ago. Those calves, those hair calves will arrive here uh, tomorrow. And uh, you know, sometime over the next week or 10 days, we'll be deharming those calves and uh, they're going to the 
calf crate from the horning and before the lift up, they just pluck the hair samples into the card, into the free post envelope, into the post box, gone. And the next thing we will know is that we will have uh, an email from ICBF after about three weeks uh, informing us that our uh, genomic test results are available. And all we have to do is click into ICBF and they're there. And the calf hasn't even been weaned yet? Oh, no, the calf was the calf not weaned. No, no. No, no. <laughs> yeah. But it's the easiest time to do it. Everything is, you know, calf is there in the little crate. Seconds is all it takes. And you have that information at hand before that calf moves out of that pen. And you can decide. We know right away whether we have something special here. Uh, whether it's something um, you know that uh, may not have a long-term future in the herd. So, if you were to if you were to rate all of the, the the different pieces of technology that have that have come in front of you in the last 30, 30 odd years, so you know you've had AI, you've had ET, you've had sex semen, and now genomics. How would you which which piece of technology do you think was the game changer? I, to be fair, there are game changers, you know. I mean, they are all absolutely massive developments. There's no doubt about that. Um, I suppose, uh, I mean, sex semen really was, I mean, that was only something you could dream of at one stage, you know. Uh, I suppose the genomics, I probably have to give the prize to the genomics, you know, in that um, that's the one that, that's the one that gives you the real picture of what you have on the ground. That's the one I think that enables you to make, uh, it enables you to make the best value of all the other technologies. You know, you have your calf there or it's heifer, you have the genomic evaluation. It gives you, uh, you know, as, as good a guide as it is possible to have of what that animal can do. And so, you know, through AI and through sex semen and through ET, it enables you then to make the breeding decision uh, to optimise the value of the calf that you're going to breed from that female that you've already genotyped. So, yeah, I suppose yep. the genotyping is probably the axle around which the wheel turns, I think, yeah. Excellent. Now, tell me finally... What's happened to the what's happened to bulls? I've got this wonderful picture of you with a bull and a and a, and a couple of rosettes. Mm. What's the whole bull game's changed? I would imagine since you know that with the use of sex semen and that sort of thing. So describe what what's happened to your to your bull market. Well, I suppose I suppose yeah. Look, the milk quotas disappeared here in Europe uh, six years ago. At that stage, we were milking about, uh, I'd say, just short of 200 cows, say 200 cows. And uh, we couldn't keep any more because we weren't going to be paid for the milk. So uh, we used to rear a number of bulls uh, for breeding every year and uh, sell them uh, and had some, had some good outings with them. Uh, that bull in that particular photograph he was the champion at the Irish Horse and Frisian Association's annual Premier Bull Sale, which is held at the last Wednesday in March of every year. And we just always have some bulls to take to that. Now, what's happened is that uh, we have moved from 200 cows to 500 cows. Uh, the staff is more or less the same. And, uh, you know, we're pretty much tied up with looking after the cows and the calves and that. We don't do any machinery work here. That's all done by contractor. Um, and I suppose we've cut back on the number of bulls that we have been rearing. We now only rear maybe three, four, five, you know. And actually, basically what they are are bull calves that were intended to be heifers. Uh, and we just rear a few of them. Uh, they're not a big part of our business uh, anymore. Um, and for some reason, or another, 
And I find I always found it very difficult to understand, you know, because a lot of people who are commercial dairy farmers were milking cows and they're more concerned about getting a bull 100 euro cheaper from somewhere rather than ensuring that they're getting a really good bull. Uh, I presume it's because they don't understand the difference between a good one and one that's not so good, you know. Anyway, the bottom line is that with everything else that's there now, the bull sales have become uh, a much, they've become an insignificant part of this business, to be honest. So genomics, sex, semen, quotas have basically spelt the death of, of the bull trade for you? Uh, they have, yes, yeah. Uh, other than, I mean, the target is, like the bull that's gone into AI, for instance, uh, I mean, he was sold at a really good price and the target is to get more of them in there and hopefully that will be the outlet for our top bull calves going forward. <coughs> that bull was actually, um, that bull was by a bull, a Canadian bull, West Coast Persis, and um, its mother is a fifth generation excellent cow. She's uh, by Cogent Twist out of a Mano Man mother that was out of a Ramas mother that was out of an Omen that was out of a Hairy Breeze that was out of a Eastland Cash that was out of a Besna Book that was out of a Rathrop Tradition Leadman that was the initial embryo that was imported. Well, if I was putting my old Australian sire analyst hat on, he could nearly get a run down here because there was a a, a number of Percy's sons that went into AI in Australia. So uh, he would pr potentially rate re reasonably well on our system, I would think, as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Persis, Persis here would be, he's an EBI of a daughter proven index of uh, 240, which would put him up there in the, uh, the, the very top proven, the very top daughter proven bulls here would be, I, I think, about 270. So he'd be, he'd be, you know, and they come back fairly rapidly from there. So I would think he'd be in the top ten or twelve mm -hmm. in rankings here. And his son there, that that bull with the bull of his bread here, he had a, he has a, a genomic index of two hundred ninety two. It's a nice little icing on the cake, isn't it? When you get a bull, bull oh, yeah. away, oh, yeah. absolutely, 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 yeah, yeah. Well, John, that's been fantastic and I appreciate your time fully understanding that you are right in the middle of carving at the moment and that everyone is extremely busy over there and so we're, we're extremely appreciative, appreciative of, of your time and um, it's been a really fantastic chat and great to catch up again. Very good, Peter. Thank you very much indeed and, um, you know, I wish uh, everybody well in Australia for the uh, coming year and, um, you know, um, I would respectfully suggest that, uh, you know, if people listening are thinking about this uh, and, and genomic testing, um, I think it's well worth doing. That's all I would say. Excellent. Thanks, John. Okay, Peter, thank you very much indeed. We'll talk soon again. Bye-bye. Yeah.